all this, folks somehow manage to find time to enjoy themselves. And I don't think we'll have any troubles at all, because telling the stories are our friends here from Evervale, a beautiful bunch of Welsh rabbits. Look at that lot. <laughs> <laughs> right, now before we hear the stories, have a look at this. Yes, I've been a collier in the Ronda for over 40 years. It's hard work, and it's skilled work, and they're risky too. We do all we can to make it as safe as possible underground. Except at weekends, the work of coal getting never stops. As one shift comes off, another goes down to take its place. Well, I hope that brought back a few memories, particularly for you, John, eh? Yes. John, now, will you tell us about your life down the pit? Well, uh, I started when I was 14 years of age. And Mum and Dad had six children. I was the <laughs> eldest. I had to go to work. <laughs> so uh, I started on my first day's work. Very hard. Now, would uh, did most uh, most boys start at fourteen then? Yes. In the business, yes. And how much did you earn? Uh, fourteen shillings a week. That was it. And how long was the shift in those days? Then? Eight hours. Eight hours. Um, seven and a half, and it started to go and see a football match. <laughs> <laughs> well, how generous they were, they weren't were they? Very generous. Now, John, tell us about your very first time, and it must have been a, an experience for a young yes. guy to do that. Well, the first time I went down the pit, my dad. He had four brothers. And on that morning, when I went on the cage to go down, they all stood around me. Because the first turn of the wheel, your breath is gone. It really went yes, down quick, it, yeah. It really go, and it's frightening. Well, I wa walked into work, it was strange, dark. And first thing I had was a heap of rubbish to get rid of. Oh, it's terrible. I suppose it's an experience, John, really, that no one could, however they described it to you, you couldn't really appreciate, could you? They couldn't, no. No one couldn't experience it if they've never experienced it themselves. That's right. You know what I mean? Yeah. What sort of kit did you take with you? Did you, you well, your moleskin trousers, of course. A tommy box. A tommy box. Now, tell us what that is. <laughs> well, Mother used to put sandwiches in there pieces of bread and butter yeah. on a lump of cheese. You didn't get a lot then, did you? That's all I had. Yeah. Eight hours. And that was your lunch, was it? That was my lunch. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I had a three can of water, pint water can. Yeah. That was my drink for the day. No tea? No tea, yeah. water. Yeah. And that's what we had to... The old like, Davy lamp. That's a hundred years old. It's beautiful, isn't it? Didn't feel so beautiful then when you first went down, though, did it, John? No, it did not. No. <laughs> I can tell you. I can believe it. Now, of course, times were very hard, but the people were always kind. Now, Glenis, you've got a story to prove that the people were kind, haven't you, about, about the lad's lunch? Yes, well, uh, my father had this young lad working with him, a young boy, probably about 14 years of age. And when they had their break now, their grub break, I should think they called it, this young boy would go away from the other miners and he would go into a corner of the pit and um, supposedly eat his lunches on his own. Mm. So he did this for quite a few days and the men wondered why. So yeah. someone went and questioned him and um, he said, well, I haven't any food in my box. He said, I wanted new working boots. And it was a choice of whether I would go without my food for a fortnight for my mother to buy me a pair of shoes. And the men, each day, one or the other, would bring and fill that yeah. box for the boy. And there wasn't a lot to spare from theirs, I no. shouldn't think. No. And that was the comradeship in the pits. Mm. Uh, more so, I think, I've heard my husband say, um, he worked in the pits and he worked in the uh, uh, Steel. steelworks. Yeah. But the comradeship in the pits far excelled yes. the SC. And if yes. he could have gone back to the pits, he would have done so. For the company because and the blokes, really. Each were mm. for each other. 
Yeah, quite right. Mm -hmm. Now, how did the how did the miners keep clean down there then, Glenys? Well, the tin bath, and they would they would come home, and and the mother and the wife uh, would get the bath in front of the fire, and I, I I think if it was two or three or four bathing, it would be the same water. <laughs> okay. And uh, you know, great right, if you were the youngest son, then, John. True. true. <laughs> Plus drop of hot water out the kettle, warming it up, kettle True. on the hob, you know. And uh, uh, there was a, a superstition that miners never washed their backs. <laughs> Is that right? But, yes. <laughs> Have a look down his collar, <laughs> will you? <he> go <laughs> <laughs> Why was that? Well, they were afraid that um, something would happen to them. It would weaken the back. It would weaken the back. back and, oh, yes. Even somebody in Ninja. He, uh, he would all pick the miners out. Black backs. Yeah. You could always pick them out. Yeah, always pick them out. In the out. swimming pool, what about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, the other main industry in Abervale was the iron and steel works. Now, Mervyn, I'm going to come to you if I may, Mervyn. Yeah. We've heard a lot of talk about the steel works so far. Indeed. Mervyn, you worked in the steel works. Yes, I worked in the steel works. I now, started in um, November 1939. Mm. I was one of the lucky ones, possibly. I had secondary education before going into work. Mm. In those days, it was called technical school. Yeah, so, that's right. Yes, mm. that's right. Yeah, and in 1939, November 39, I started work and um, started as an apprentice at eight and sixpence per week. Did people try to work in the steelworks rather than go down the pits, Moen, Would you say? Well, in those days, Roy, we had the essential works order, and you were directed where you actually went to work. Oh, really? Oh, yes, yes. So you got no choice in the matter. No choice in the matter at all. No, I was training uh, as a young man then in the air training course, it was called. Mm. And, um, well, I was carrying three stripes then in those days, but there was no hope of going into the forces because you were on the essential works order and you were held in work. I'll tell you what, Marvin, this might bring back a few memories for you. Talk us through this little bit of film. This is very old, of course. This is way before my time, really. Yeah. This but actually it's... is 1917. Yes, 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 yes. 1924, I was born, so this is uh, a little <laughs> before me. Mind you, most of these buildings were remaining for many, many years afterwards. Yeah. The blast engine house that was there, that was the generating house. Yes. Until yes, yes. Uh, quite recently. Oh, yes, was it? Yeah. And those are the Victoria furnaces. And indeed, just after the war, it's fair to say that there were um, 12,500 people employed in steel in Ebervale. 12,500. 12, and now we are down to less than 2,000. So there's an awful lot of jobs being lost there. Problems never seem to stop in Ebervale, no, do they? indeed. No. Well, I tell you what, let's, let's take a look at this piece of very interesting <laughs> film. It was a marvellous reception which the King received in South Wales on his visit to the long-suffering communities of that depressed area. The loyal people of his old principality gave him a tumultuous greeting, all the more sincere because it was realised that the idea of the visit was the King's own and sprang from his real concern for the distress of this sorely tried region. The blackest spot of all in his visit was at Dallas, where there were once 9,000 men at work in the steel factory. Everything is now derelict and deserted, but His Majesty brought hope to replace despair. Something will be done, the King said. Well, a visit by King Edward VIII in 1936, that was, John. Yes. And it produced that phrase that he'll always be remembered for. Yeah. Something will be done. Yes. Was anything done, John? Not, not a thing. Nothing. Not a thing. Well, yeah. Because uh, you go there now, you can see the tips are now. And, of course, soon after he ab abdicated, nothing was ever done. Nothing was ever done. Nothing much done, I know. Well, during that time, of course, the Depression was widespread and Wales suffered mm. particularly badly, of course. Yeah. Now, Irene, can I come to you, Irene? What was it like in those days for people who were out of work? Well, we were very poor. Um, I only remember my father working nine weeks. Uh, men waited for a nine weeks on the council or whatever, and, and they, they were able to work nine weeks. And my father worked on a refuse collection, and that's the only time I remember him working. And, uh, of course, uh, we ha didn't have much money. Uh, we had an order from, from Doug Carter, the grocers, uh, and once that was eaten, you sort of were, were left with bread and uh, paste, if you were lucky, or jam. Um, were they, were they actually, did people draw, draw a dole in those days, Irene? Yes, uh, but there was a sort of means test. 
oh, uh, yeah. by which you, you, you know, you sort of, uh, how do you, if you had any money at all, well, uh, it's like sort of social security, really, but uh, very, very little money. Um, and as I say, we, we had, um, we often had to eat bread and uh, margarine sort of thing. I remember my father, for supper, he'd say, oh, great, we're going to have baradour tonight. And I used to think, oh, lovely, baradour. And he'd get a cup. And he'd break bread pieces and put in it, and then he'd put salt and pepper, and we'd still look and think, oh, this is a marvellous dish, and a bit of margarine, and he'd mix it all up with boiling water, and he'd say, this is baradour we're having for supper. Mm -hmm. And we used to think it was lovely, and it was only bread and water. It's Welsh for Welsh. <coughs> Barra is Welsh for bread, and dour is Welsh for water. But I thought it was a marvellous dish, mm -hmm. and it was baradour for supper. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Welsh so, cooking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was called relief in them days. Oh, Arbor. Arbor uh, relief. Arbor relief. Yeah. Tom, what were conditions generally like in the valleys at that time? Very bad. Mm. As a boy going to school, the teacher went. I was away eight weeks. And when I went back to school, the teacher said, Miss Purnell, Tommy, you better. I said, I am being ill, miss. What's been wrong then? I said, I didn't have any shoes. And that's the truth. And that's why you never went to school? Eight mm. weeks, I had no shoes. Uh, talk about hard times. I had an uncle who has had a good voice. A forum went up to London to busk on the streets. Yeah. And what they did with the money, they sent it back, and they done the children's school, uh, shoes to go back to school. With the money that they raised? We buy the leather and the men to do it for the men to, the children to go back to school. Yeah, it's very the, hard time. The right? words mean test, Roy, you know, they, they hold such terrible connotation in, in, not only in Evervale, but in Wales generally, where people sold any jewellery they were made. Mm. 